you're listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. One of the incredible aspects of living in Europe is the access to rich bread and baking traditions. They may vary, of course, between France, Poland, Germany, and Portugal, let's say, but what they share is the ongoing movement to protect them. It's also the theme of the new cookbook by my friend based in Berlin, Laurel Kotokvila. The book, New European Baking, was the subject of a conversation that took place at the Red Wheelbarrow Bookstore on October 6th. This episode is, therefore, the recording of that interview. It also features a discussion with Xavier Netri, the head bread baker at the beloved Parisian bakery, Utopie, who is profiled in Laurel's book. That conversation was in French, but I summarized the message at the end of the episode. Enjoy! I'm so pleased to be here with Laurel, whom I believe so many of you know uh, because of, well, what Penelope said. You know, she, she comes from Berlin with three businesses, not only, not only Fine Bagels, which she has run since 2012, and Shakespeare and Company, which she runs with her husband, Romain, a bookstore also in Berlin. But more recently, uh, you, you started a wine bar called Le Balto. So, you know, you've, you've got your hands full. And given this, I'm sort of wondering why, for your debut book, you chose baking. Good question. <laughs> because you, you, know, you, you, you were involved in so many different things, it could have gone in a number of different directions. So why baking? So why baking? I guess I primarily identify as a baker. Um, that's how I got my life together, basically, uh, more than 10 years ago when we moved to Berlin and I, I was really just following this man here. I was young, I had no purpose. Um, and so I opened my bakery and that was always, and really still to this day is my primary focus. I love it, I love making bread and I'm very lucky to have been mentored and gone through the whole French system, especially with people like Xavier as my teachers, and and uh, I see some other faces here, Cedric, Vincent, people who have formed me into a baker also. So yeah, I would say. So there was no other topic, really. That made the most sense. You're I, a baker at heart. I have no other book to write. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, so there's so many interesting anecdotes in this book, uh, you know, for those of you who don't intend to become the next great baker, that's perfectly okay. There are beautiful stories in this book. Um, and I love when you say, actually right from the beginning, that bread can help you figure out where you are, which I interpreted both literally and metaphorically. Uh, so for those, for those of us here, what do you mean by that? What do I mean by that? Well, I, I think in this very globalized world, that we live in, right? And nowadays you can go and find, frankly, the same coffee shop, the same clothing stores, whatever, whatever city you go to in the world. And yes, there can be a tendency towards this in bread too, but for the most part, bread has stayed fairly regional, even with industrialization. I know when I'm in Paris when I look at the bread shelf. I know when I'm in Germany when I look at the bread shelf. I know when I'm in Poland when I look at the bread shelf. And that gives me some faith that there is still some regional diversity in, in this exciting treasure hunty way. And we're going to go back to that because there's something else about diversity in bread that I, 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 I want to ask you about. But, um, now, of course, we have to talk about the title of this book because that leads the rest of the, re the, rest of the discussion. And I know from experience having a book uh, called The New Paris with the word new in the title that um, it can raise some eyebrows. So what do you mean by the new European baking? Right. I mean, I think to put new in any book title is sort of showing a lot of chutzpah and it's setting yourself up to disappoint people. But you can, as long as you can justify it and you can... Right, okay, so what, what I'm saying when I say new European baking, I'm talking more about a movement, a generation of people, I'm looking at a lot of faces here, who are pushing quality, creativity, style of work 
forward in a strongly artisan, ethical, creative way that um, was, you know, in the 20th century, you had the industrialization of baking and a lot of both quality and traditions were, for all intents and purposes, sort of lost. And these are people who are repopularizing and really influencing the new bakeries. So that's, that's really what I mean by new European baking, because in a way it's a misnomer, because a lot of what's new is actually looking into the past and rediscovering things and techniques and so on. See, you defended it perfectly well. Oh, thank God. <laughs> um, the way it's organized is uh, very smart, um, very practical. You have a lot of images that show step by step. So if you do intend to make these recipes, you see her hands. I'm assuming they're your hands. They're my hands. Okay, so you see her hands and, and making bread and making these unbelievable baked goods that I, I mean, honestly, I should not have started reading it before mealtime. Um, but you go from bread, you cover brioche, you cover laminated pastry, you cover tarts and biscuits and then fillings. Um, but you also highlight, uh, you know, various countries, right? So you didn't just focus on France where you spent a lot of time, you don't just focus on Germany. Um, but in all of these countries, there are bakers who excel at the techniques you've just described. Um, as a resident of Berlin, but someone who has spent so much time elsewhere, um, where do your personal affections lean? Mm. Well, I don't want to suck up to this crowd and say the French. <laughs> it's not good for your egos. I actually think the place I feel most at home in a bakery and in a way the most familiar is in Poland. Really? Okay. And yeah. why is that? Why is that? Um, the style of baking, a lot of the brioches and the milk breads and all of that, it's so familiar. You're from the East Coast, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's there's, true. There's a lot of the Danishes, the stuff like that. It, it has a nostalgic, homey taste to me. Nice, heavy rise and things like that. So It's true. I didn't grow up with croissant or, or brioche or traditional French brioche. Exactly. I grew up with more of the Scandinavian, Eastern European type desserts. Mm -hmm. so, so you'd say if you had your pick, you'd go straight to a Polish bakery. You hear that, all you French, <laughs> French people in here? <laughs> Look, I might stop at a French bakery <laughs> on, on the way. way. I might. So with bread, okay, we, we know the moment we're living in, we came out of two years of a pandemic where everyone thought of themselves as a newfound sourdough baker. Um, mm -hmm. So sourdough, you know, there's very much a boom across the world and you mm -hmm. feel it and you see it in Europe. Um, that creates, or at least it could create the appearance of a kind of sameness. Mm -hmm. uh, you go to one city, there's sourdough. You go to another, there's sourdough. So you know, how is it that this hasn't created some sort of a monoculture in bread? I, I think there is a little bit of a monoculture happening. Uh -huh. I wouldn't say completely no to that. Um, I do think there is, in the same way that you had the third wave coffee shops that were one after another after another the same, there's a lot of, okay, it's another generic sourdough bakery. But I don't think it can ever really be a true monoculture because for the same reason when he makes a baguette, it's just so much nicer than the one I make <laughs> because it's in the hands, it's in the gesture, it's in the repetition, the years of experience that people have. And also a lot of the ethos of these new bakeries has to do with sourcing flour and and so a lot of people are sourcing locally. They're, they're really digging into what, do, what products do I have in my neighborhood. And so for that reason, a lot of these bakeries really are, even if, meh, there's a lot going for like a Scandi modern kind mm -hmm. of aesthetic, the product itself is going to be different. So a baker can still infuse a bit of their personality into a sourdough. Yeah, absolutely. So... There's a lot of beautiful imagery, not just of sourdough bread, but literally of everything you'd ever want to eat in a bakery. Um, 
but there's beautiful storytelling. The way you tell profiles uh, or you write these profiles of 11 different bakers is really a testament to how much their craft speaks to you and how much mm -hmm. you respect this trade. So that mm -hmm. is loud and clear yeah. when you're reading. Um, so you have bakers in Berlin, but you have them in France, in Portugal, in Spain, in mm -hmm. Poland. How did you find them? Obviously, you knew Xavier in France. Mm -hmm. You knew uh, Julie, who's also in France, and you mm -hmm. know the people in, in, in Berlin. How did you go about selecting the others? And then how did you, you know, decide that there would only be 11? Well, that was my publisher. <laughs> it's always I, the publisher's fault. Yeah, I asked for a thousand pages. They gave me what two sixty. So, okay. so, so that was a, a question of pages. But it, it was also um, I wanted to give just a peek into the uniqueness of everyone's story because nobody comes at this from the same angle, and I think that's quite inspiring to people who are maybe looking to become a baker or want, just want to know more about who's the person making their bread mm. and who is that person beyond the oven, really. And um, so it, I put in people I knew, but that who I knew as people that I really admire mm -hmm. and who have an incredible talent and that I think are doing something special in this world and then there were a few people I didn't know but it was always um, what's that uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon yeah does anyone separation of so six degrees of separation is, does that game exist in France yeah yeah, yeah. okay well any anyway. some nodding okay mm -hmm. all, all right so I think I think it's it's like really one one degree of separation in the bakery world Someone always knows someone, and so... Um, so it was as simple as that. It, w it was as simple as that. Can you introduce me to this person? I see what they're doing. I really admire it, and then make the intro. So because you mentioned your publisher, um, I have another sort of inside baseball question. Okay. Um, you, how did you decide on this image? Because obviously, you know, there's so many exquisite photos in the book. Is it for the familiarity of croissant, you know, that it'll stand out on the, on, the, on the bookshelf for people? How did you come to decide that this was the cover? Um, well, I guess, I guess it's, in a way, it's a little of a fuck you to the new, right? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> sorry, excuse me. I'm from Boston. I, I have no manners. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's sort of simple. I didn't want to put bread on the cover because I felt like, that can frighten people off. Mm. Croissants should frighten people off, but they look so delicious. <laughs> and actually, it's a very simple explanation, Lindsay. I really liked this tea towel. You're kidding. <laughs> no. Well, it's beautiful indigo dye. <laughs> so no, it's very it's just amusing because, you know, sometimes you have stories where publishers impose an image. They say this is the one that our team says is going to jump right off the shelf and then there are others where it's you know some other detail and sure enough they let me choose it's a different detail that's great because yeah. it really does jump out at you and i'm starving um and it smells a lot like bread where we are right now but you can just imagine if we were surrounded in a room full of croissant what that would smell like um okay so that's interesting and i have another i mean you're all going to read this book you're going to read these beautiful stories you're going to want to bake if you're not already a baker um, but before we turn to Xavier, um, I have one other question specific to something you included in here. Mm -hmm. um, and also because we're in the month of the Jewish high holidays, mm -hmm. I have to ask. Um, you hint at a little controversy surrounding the rugelach you made initially mm -hmm. when you opened Fine Bagels. Can yes. you tell us about that? Okay, well, I mean... There's an American rugelach and there's an Israeli rugelach. And Israeli rugelach are just better, okay? They're yeasted, they're just covered in sweet syrup, they melt in your mouth. But that's not what I grew up with. Is that what you grew up with? No, no. no. So none of us grew up with that. So I was making this American style one that's more of a cookie, it's more of like a short pastry. And in Berlin, a lot of my clients are Israelis, and so they would come in and say, 
that's not a rugelach. Why, you, why do you make a rugelach like that? You don't know anything about a rugelach. And I got so sick of hearing that that I said, okay, fine. I'm going to do it the Israeli way. But every once in a while, I... You switch it up and things? have a fight with someone? No, I, I... Oh, God, no, I could never switch it up. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I could never, I could never switch it up. Um, I... Because someone would punch me. <laughs> it's more of a on top of that. Okay. An additional item. An additional item, just so people can say, that's not rogalach. Why is the sign on that saying rogalach? People feel very strongly about their baked goods. Let's, I mean, I think that's the moral of the story here. Passionate. So talking about passion, that's a good segue. Mm -hmm. um, and again, just before we switch the mic over to Xavier, I want to ask you, mm -hmm. what is it about his work that you find so compelling and so so much a, uh, an example of, of, of this European baking uh, approach, this, this movement? Well, Xavier is, unlike a lot of the bakers in the book, he's a lifelong baker. He started as a teenager, very young, and he has such an incredible amount of experience and fluency in his gestures and how to do things. So he has a very intuitive style of baking and at the same time he's always exploring new creative flavor combinations very very much has a almost culinary approach to bread and at the same time he's always teaching people like me how to be a better baker and I knew he was a good guy when one time I, I left the yeast out of, um, was it a petit depotre? <laughs> I don't know. I, I left that out. And I just saw him take one deep breath. <laughs> so zen. <laughs> he smiled at me and he said, everyone does it, Laurel. And so I was, okay, he's a good guy. <laughs> yeah. is, that, is that because other bakers would freak? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, most I would probably free. Okay. <laughs> so Xavier, who's with us today, is the head bread maker, bread baker at Utopie. So yeah, so Xavier, who's in charge of the bed, bread program at Utopie, which is, you know, one of the most beloved bakeries in, in Paris. Um, we're really, really happy that he could be here with, here with us tonight. So without further ado, ça va? Très bien. <rire> Merci d'être là, franchement, parce que c'est déjà, avec les horaires d'un boulanger, ce n'est pas, pas forcément évident. Ah, euh, comment et pourquoi est-ce que vous êtes entré dans l'univers de la boulangerie Vous aviez 13 ans, c'est ça, quand vous avez commencé C'est ça, oui. Donc, ouais, pour, pourquoi comment, comment, euh, Pourquoi c'était le, euh, le, le, le rôle de boulanger qui vous a... Alors, au début, honnêtement, euh, bah, comme je discutais avec une dame là, tout à l'heure, euh, par dépit, ouais, vraiment. Au début, c'était pas par passion, c'était pas une envie, c'était pas. Euh... C'est vraiment par obligation, ouais. parce que j'avais des problèmes euh, dans la famille. Ma mère était malade, tout simplement. Je m'occupais de ma mère depuis l'âge de 9 ans, donc fallait que je commence à travailler très jeune. Je me suis pris en main très rapidement. J'ai travaillé un peu à gauche, à droite, sur des marchés, sur des euh, un peu partout, à faire n'importe quoi pour gagner un peu d'argent. Et un ami à moi, son père avait une boulangerie. J'ai un peu mis les pieds dedans, euh, regardé ce que c'était, et puis j'ai posé la question s'il avait besoin de manœuvre de quelqu'un pour euh, faire euh, n'importe quoi, même balayer. <rire> et euh, bah, du coup, bah, je suis rentré dans la boulangerie comme ça. J'ai commencé comme ça, au tout début. Et en fait, euh, si, si ce n'était pas par passion initialement, aujourd'hui, mm -hmm. est-ce que vous diriez que c'est le grand amour euh... ah, Aujourd'hui, euh, ouais, c'est totalement une passion. Hein. Carrément, c'est... Euh, <rire> bah, euh, ça fait maintenant 22, 23 ans que je suis boulanger. Et euh, ouais, c'est euh, une passion, totalement. J'adore ce que je fais. Partager le métier, c'est ce que j'adore le plus. Et Laurel, elle, elle, elle parle beaucoup dans le livre euh, de, vos, de vos mains. Évidemment, ouais. c'est quand même l'outil principal. Ouais. Euh, comment décrirez-vous votre approche parce qu'on peut être, ce qu'elle a montré et ce que vous montrez tous les jours chez Utopie, c'est qu'on peut être créatif aussi dans le pain. Ouais. Alors, comment, voilà, quelle est votre approche, euh, votre conviction personnelle au pain hum, Je dirais euh, de l'envie et euh, 
Et euh, de la ténacité surtout. Voilà, il faut être, euh, faut, faut, faut être euh, comment dire... Euh... Ah, je n'ai pas, pas trop les mots, mais euh, je pense que faut avoir la niaque quoi, pour être boulanger. Il faut, faut le vouloir, il faut, faut aimer ce qu'on fait. Euh, comme la... chaque métier, euh, être créatif. Ouais. Et la créativité, d'où est-ce que ça, ça vient du coup Parce qu'il ah, y, y a des associations que vous faites dans le pain qui sont... Voilà, très unique, très innovant, mm -hmm. ça, vient, ça vient comment bah En fait, ça, vient, ça peut venir d'une discussion, ça peut venir quand je suis en train de faire mes courses, je vois tel, tel produit et tel produit, et là je me pose la question, hm, est-ce que ça pourrait matcher dans du pain <rire> J'essaye, je fais des tests, et si ça marche, bah, tant mieux, si ça ne marche pas, bah, on essaie autre chose. Ou des fois, bah, c'est quand je vais au restaurant, je mange un truc et là je fais, ah ouais ah mais ça, ça c'est bon, ça peut aller dans le pain ça Et j'essaye et des fois bah, ça marche, des fois ça marche pas, des fois ça marche. Parce qu'il y a aussi celui au riz soufflé, euh, tes match, tes, tes verts. Ouais, tes verts, tes matcha, ouais, au riz soufflé, ouais. Et, Alors celui-ci à la base, euh, c'est mes patrons qui m'ont proposé un thé vert cranberry. J'aimais pas du tout. Il fallait une touche sucrée afin d'atténuer l'amertume du, du thé vert. J'ai trouvé le riz soufflé, j'ai bah, repensé en fait à ma jeunesse quand je mangeais mes céréales, bah, les, euh, <rire> les craquis, hein, c'est les céréales de, de, de l'enfance. Et euh, bah, on a mis, euh, j'ai essayé de mettre du, des craquis dedans, des, du riz soufflé tout simplement. C'est extra, c'est extra. Donc, voilà, merci. <rire> Alors, j'évoquais les horaires avant, les horaires qui, peut, qui, qui peuvent piquer, euh, l'aspect très physique du métier aussi. Et malgré tout ça, il y a de plus en plus de gens qui s'y intéressent. Euh, soit pour démarrer leur carrière ou, ou même en reconversion euh, professionnelle. Est-ce que c'est un effet de mode pour vous euh, Non, pas forcément. Franchement, honnêtement, j'ai formé énormément de stagiaires. Euh, beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup. Et tous les stagiaires que j'ai eus, euh, c'était des personnes motivées. Et ce n'était pas une mode. Enfin, après, il bon, y en a deux, trois qui n'étaient pas faits pour ça parce qu'ils ne savaient pas où ils mettaient les pieds. Bon, ça arrive, hein, on ne peut pas toujours savoir où on va. Mais euh, non, je trouve pas que c'est une histoire de mode ou quoi. Euh, en général, les stagiaires ont, sont focus sur quelque chose et ils ont envie de, de, de faire ce, sur quoi, de faire ce qu'ils ont envie de faire, la boulangerie. Et quand ils se lancent dedans, bah, en général, ils s'en sortent très bien et, et ils arrivent à ouvrir des boulangeries en général. Donc c'est très bien. Quoi. Donc l'engouement est plutôt positif pour ouais, le métier. Carrément, ouais. carrément, carrément. Et c'est bien parce que c'est un métier qui est... Euh, qui est compliqué et ça ouvre, bah en fait ça montre que ça peut ouvrir des portes, à... c'est tout le monde qui peut faire ce métier, mmh. tant que la personne est motivée, n'importe qui peut faire ce métier. Si l'outil de la main fonctionne comme il faut. Aussi, oh, oui, <rire> oui, oui, oui. Euh, bon, en 20, 22, 23 ans de métier, euh, quelle est la plus grande évolution que vous avez vue dans le pain Que ce soit le style que les consommateurs euh, désirent de, de déguster, que... Voilà, les, 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 les mélanges qui peuvent être faits, euh, qu'est-ce qu qui est euh, pour vous euh, la, ce qui ressort le plus Alors l'évolution du levain, bien évidemment, parce qu'à euh, un moment donné, le levain, c'était bah, connu, ça s'est arrêté pendant une dizaine d'années, c'est revenu il y a quelques années, là. Et, euh, et aussi la diversité des pains, dans le sens où euh, les gens sont un peu plus curieux. Donc ça, c'est bien. <rire> c'est très bien parce que moi, je peux me permettre de faire des trucs un peu fol folkloriques. Donc c'est très bien. <rire> donc, euh, ouais, surtout l'évolution sur le levain. Ouais. Mm. Le levain. Et c'est quoi l'avenir, du coup, euh, du métier que Comment vous voyez les choses euh, changer Franchement, pour le coup, je ne sais pas. Je, je pense que bah, c'est un métier qui restera, euh, qui restera en place encore euh, des décennies parce que bah, la boulangerie, c'est la, bah, la base française. Hein, c'est... Euh, c'est un métier que, bah, qui est là depuis tout, toujours. Hein. Donc, euh, franchement, le futur, je ne saurais pas vous dire. Je n'ai pas tendance à me projeter dans le futur. <rire> J'ai du mal avec ça. Mais... Bah, je ne sais pas. Que des bonnes choses. De, ouais. de, que de... des bonnes choses. Par contre, je vois des bonnes choses. Ouais. Des bonnes choses. Ça, Tant mieux. Ouais. Et puis, une dernière petite question pour. Euh, enfin, Peut-être c'est un défi, je ne sais pas, mais euh, est-ce que vous avez un pain dont vous êtes le plus fier, que vous avez pu créer euh... Depuis le début de, de votre carrière euh, bah, C'est peut-être le pain que Laurel a mis dans, dans, dans son livre. Euh, parce que café, euh, caramel, euh, en général, bon, les pains que je fais ne sont pas trop vus autre part. Euh, et le café caramel, vraiment celui-ci, euh, c'est une fierté parce que c'est quelque chose qui, 
Et qui m'est sorti de la tête comme ça et un pas au café, moi on n'en voit pas. On non. Voit un peu nulle part. C'est très unique. Donc euh, ce café caramel était vraiment, vraiment, on va dire, mon top. Ouais. <rire> bon, maintenant tout le monde doit aller euh, déguster euh, à Zap tous ces pains. Xavier Merci, Xavier Nétri, euh, Boulangerie Utopie et Laurel qui a mis en avant euh, bah, 11, 11 personnes qui euh, façonnent aussi euh, la boulangerie euh, en Europe. Bravo Ou brava That's the show for today. As always, thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing with friends. You can find all previous episodes of the New Paris podcast wherever you stream your podcasts and on World Radio Paris. If you're enjoying these conversations, please consider picking up a copy of the New Paris book or my recent release, The New Parisienne, from your local booksellers. Until next time, à bientôt.